Good morning and welcome to our Sunday school service. I have some prayer requests I uh, wanted to go through here this, uh, this morning. Uh, we wanted to, to uh, remember uh, you know, Junior and, and his family. Uh, we also uh, want to remember you know, Steve and uh, Jessica as well. She has some procedures coming up this week. Uh, Larry, Gailey, and Kelly. And we also have uh, Allie and Sherry Sherman. And we want to pray for our country and our lost loved ones and the nursing home staff and patients. You know, we want to remember those that are affected by the, 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 you know, the coronavirus you know, as well. Now, speaking of which, I, I have a couple of, at work that I know uh, specifically at least one of them has it. Uh, so I want to remember them. His name is Jeff Parmenia. Uh, my, uh, my stepmother Diane, she's uh, currently in the hospital and uh, waiting some results. So I uh, wanted to you know, add that in as well. And uh, you know, my, my wife's grandmother, she fell and broke her, her leg a couple of weeks ago and she's still healing from that. So we want to remember that. Uh, you know, we also want to remember um, you know, Allie and Sherry Sherman as well as uh, Anna Contreras and uh, Mr. Massey. Uh, James Brown, uh, Gabriel Duggar. Yeah, so let's go ahead and uh, you know, open up in a word of prayer before we before we dig into the lesson day. Lord, we thank you for uh, everything that you do for us. Uh, you know, God, we we ask that you would be with us during these trying times, Lord. That you'd be with our country and our leaders and help them make the best decisions to be able to help us navigate through this, Lord. Uh, Lord, we know that. Uh, you know, unlike for us, it wasn't a surprise for you. And so we know that you're going to be using this uh, you know, pandemic and these things to your glory. Uh, God, we ask that you be with these many prayer requests that we've had that you know, I've mentioned, as well as the, you know, many others that you know, are listed here that, you, that aren't mentioned, or you know, any that uh, you know, the listeners that uh, are, you know, are watching this may have that you know, haven't been able to communicate with us. Lord, we ask that you be with those as well, that you would and we ask that you would touch each of us through this lesson here that I'm, I'm going to go over, Lord. Uh, you know, God, we know that uh, you are just, and I'm so glad today to be able to uh, share that, you know, the message that you have from, from this uh, small book here to, to be able to explain that, Lord. Uh, you know, God, I ask that you would you know, be with me and help me relay this message, God, and help me lift you up, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, so... Uh, this week's theme is uh, you know, he makes all things right and you know, we're lying in God's justice. So if you ever uh, you know, said these words, you know, life is not fair, I know that if you have children, you, you've certainly heard it. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, Maddie and I were, were playing a, a board game uh, the other day, and it was based on uh, the, the whole story of the Bible. So you know, we started out, we started out in creation. And uh, you, know, you, would, you would roll uh, six-sided dice, and you'd be able to get like, whatever you landed on. You got so many points, or had so many taken away based on what it was, based on what it was. You know, for example, in creation, you know, you'd land and be like, it was, on the sixth day, you know, God created a, a, you know, a man, Adam and Eve, and you would get three points. Well, at, at the end of it, you know, you're, you're stopped, and you have to roll the dice again, and you have you have the two choices, and uh, if you roll the seven. <laughs> which you know, isn't possible with six-sided dice, you, you ate from the uh, tree of life. And you rolled one through six, then, uh, you know, like Adam, you sinned and ate from the knowledge of the tree of good and evil. Well, you know, Matt, you pointed out that's not fair because you can't exactly, you can't do, you can't roll a seven-sided dice. Uh, you know, however, it, it's a good thing that we can use and teach that you know, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You know, we're no different from Adam. We would have done the same thing. And so, uh, you know, perhaps, uh, you, know, you know, as an adult, you may have said that yourself about getting punished for things that uh, you were blamed for or didn't deserve. Now, today we're going to see how God is always just and righteous in uh, what he does. And so, uh, we're going to look at here at, uh, let's talk about a few, a few things, uh, you know, revenge. That's... Uh, seems to just be oozing from everything in our culture. You know, from, uh, from TV, like a, you know, Star Trek, and you have that uh, you know, alien race that they use, the, the Klingons, that say that uh, you know, revenge is a dish best served cold. 
Uh, you know, you see it in movies like The Gladiator and Unforgiven, you know, Batman, that's a big part of his story in the comic books and The Punisher. It, 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 even literature, and even like, we can go back even further, we can look at the Iliad and uh, Hamlet and see that, uh, you know, that was their, they, they would see revenge and see that as their form of justice. However, revenge is not justice. You know, it's uh, prompted by self-will and bitterness and evil motives. And, uh, you know, we can see that, uh, you know, justice actually has its roots in God's nature. You know, being created in him, His image, we have this innate sense with this innate sense for justice, uh, for right and wrong. And even non-Christians have a have a notion of this. You know that, uh, and we see uh, many disagree over. Like, for example, we can see that you know today, uh, even non-Christians are calling for a fair and just society. And uh, you know, many have a, a disagreement on what exactly that means, and. Uh, but, you know, it shows that there's that innate sense and longing for some sort of right or fairness. And uh, so it shows that everyone that wants to reward what is right and punish what is wrong. And, you know, while they're uh, bringing this up, we, we have an excellent chance to point to God and explain exactly why things you know, are, are the way they are and why things are bad and, and why they, they need these help is because... They have a struggle explaining some of these things because they don't have the solid foundation of God's truth. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, go over a few things here as we get look at the book of Nahum. You know, we see this uh, reward and punishment pr play out with the city of Nineveh. Uh, it's the capital of Assyria, and about 100 years beforehand, you know, Jonah had came and preached to them. You know, to uh, re repent and talk of God's mercy. And uh, God uh, withheld his judgment because they had repented. And, you know, however, in, in Nahum's time, they had went back to their old, old ways of idolatry and uh, their brutality. You know, in fact, they were you know, famous for their, their brutality because they would do things like uh, uh, you know, put people in the desert, bury them up to their necks, hold their tongue out so that, uh, and have their mouth open and tie their tongue to a stake and have it held there, and they would sit there and let them cook in the desert. Uh, yeah. And they would just do many other horrible things like uh, taking the skin off their captives, impaling their enemies, you know, cutting off limbs, burning them in fire, putting out their eyes, and all sorts of other horrific acts. So the Lord sent Nahum to declare his intent to destroy Nineveh and the whole Assyrian Empire. Their sin had brought God's righteous judgment upon them. This gives us all a warning as well. When we disregard the Lord's mercy, He will deal with us with His justice. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, read through the entirety of the uh, book here because it's or this uh, chapter here because there's just 15 verses, and then uh, I'll go back and, and go over some of these verses as we go through each individual section here. All right, so uh, in verse uh, one one. The Burden of Nineveh, the Book of the Vision of Nahum, the uh, El Koshat, God is a jealous, God is jealous, and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance upon his adversaries, and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way. In the whirlwind, and in the storm, and in the clouds of the dust of his feet. He rebuketh the sea, and maketh it dry. He drieth up all the rivers. Bashan languisheth, and, and Carmel, and the flower of Lebanon languisheth. The mountains quake at him, and the hills melt. The earth is burned in his presence. Yea, the world, and all that dwell therein. Who can stand before his indignation? Uh, and who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trusteth him. But with an overrunning flood, he will make an utter end of the place thereof, and the darkness shall pursue his enemies. What do we imagine against the Lord? He will make an utter end. Affliction shall not rise up a second time. For while they be 
folded together as thorns, and while they are drunken as drunkards, they shall be devoured as stubble, fully dry. There is one that come out, out of thee that imagineth evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor. Thus saith the Lord, though they be quiet, and likewise many yet, thus shall they be cut down when he shall pass through. Though I have afflicted thee, I will afflict thee no more. For now I will break his yoke from off thee, and will burst thy bonds in sunder. The Lord hath given a commandment concerning thee, that no more of thy name shall be sown. Out of the house of thy gods will I cut off graven image, and molten image. I will make thy grave, for thou art vile. Behold, upon the mountains the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that, punish, that publishes peace. O Judah, keep thy solemn feast, perform thy vows, for the wicked shall no more pass through thee. He is utterly cut off. So Nahum recorded his vision about Nineveh, uh, given to him uh, by God. I mean, we don't have much information about Nahum about, other than where he's uh, from, you know, uh, El Kosh. Uh, Nahum foretells the destruction of the city of Nineveh and gives us insight into God's mercy. Uh, you know, like uh, Nineveh had been preached to Jonah a hundred years before, they re repented, and God mercifully spared them. As time passed, they fall back into idolatry and, uh, and their wicked ways. And so Nahum stood in the council of the Lord and uh, was, uh, was, given this, was given this sentence to, uh, to relay to them. And uh, you know, we can actually see that with the, with the first word, you know, the, the, the burden of the first words, the burden of Nineveh. You know, anytime that you see the, you know, the burden of, you know, that uh, God's judgment is coming. Uh, if, so, for example, I can just go back to, uh, you know, Isaiah. Like any time that you see this in the prophets, that's that's what's going to happen. Uh, you know, in 17.1, uh, it says the burden of Damascus. Behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city and shall be a ruinous heap. So we see that it's going to start out with just the sins of judgment. And that's part of his nature. You know, he's holy and righteous. Uh, God cannot uh, you know, be in the presence of it cannot stand sin in His presence, and uh, therefore it must be punished. You know, the Lord is uh, is jealous. Uh, he demands exclusive worship, being that He's the Creator and Lord of all. And uh, you know, what He's done is worthy of our total and absolute worship. You know, whenever people fail to honor and trust Him as God, uh, that sin of rebellion brings the righteous vengeance of wrath. Uh, you know, in His justice, uh, God is always right. You know, even in, in showing mercy, and then uh, you know, we have we can go on and uh, let's look at a couple of questions here in uh, in verse six that he uh, uh, that the name has. You know, who can stand before his in, in indignation, and who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? You know, we, we see that uh, his uh, that no one was going to escape God's anger toward their sinfulness uh, as a uh, uh, you know, verse 7 points out, unless they trust him. So, you know, at the end of verse 7, it says that, uh, or in verse 7, you know, he's that strong, he's good, and that stronghold for him that knoweth and trusts in him. And then, uh, you know, along with, uh, and then you go know, 6 along with 8 and 9, uh, describe the devastation that would come to Nineveh, Nineveh when it fell. You know, being overrun, an overrunning flood. And uh, it's saying that it will be an utter end, you know, a complete and total end. And you know, we can see this uh, you know, even in history, that the city would be broken down and overrun, and uh, that uh, it would be so thorough that in uh, 401 B.C., when Greek historian uh, Xenophon passed through the area, he saw no trace of Nineveh. And then uh, verse 12 summarizes uh, that verdict against Nineveh. That uh, thus saith the Lord, though they be quiet, and likewise many, yet shall they be cut down when he shall pass through. Like he's declaring that total and complete destruction. And so, uh, you know, that, that despite Assyria's mighty armies and everything that they had, the, Lord venge the Lord's vengeance would cut down that great city, and it, it would be passed into history's night. It would be no more. And so, uh, you know, we can look at... Uh, you know, this section here with 
talking about Lord, the Lord displaying His justice and bringing wrath upon the rebellion of the world. And we have in, uh, in Romans uh, 9, 14, you know, Paul asking, you know, is there any injustice on, uh, on God's part? So let's, let's look at that uh, there in Romans. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? And his quick response is, you know, God forbid, or certainly not. And, uh, you know, he was speaking of, of God's choice of Jacob over Esau. Uh, you know, the answer to that question, uh, uh, you know, as well, is what we have here in this first chapter in Nathan. You know, we, it's absolutely not. He's incapable of, of being unjust. You know, because his unchanging nature is always righteous. You know, it's always good. He is being righteous when he brings punishment on those that uh, sin and reject him, uh, just as when he is showing grace and mercy uh, for those who do not deserve his favor. Uh, just as Jonah preached God's mercy before, and now Nahum preached their destruction, uh, you know, he is on the same city. You know, he is correct in that. You know, we can learn here not to shy away from speaking about God's judgment and uh, focusing only on his mercy. Instead, we should stand for what is right and against those who practice evil. So uh, let's look at some other verses here in this next, se uh, in this next section from this, uh, from this book here. We witness the Lord's justice through his power to work in the natural world. And, you know, that may even have you asking me with uh, you know, the current situation, you know, about the pandemic. Is, is this something that he's you know, released upon us as judgment? I don't know, but it's certainly possible. You know, it wouldn't be the first time, and he's not caught, it, he's not caught by surprise. And I can say that, you know, standing up here, I, I can't honestly say that uh, if you know, God had deserved, decided to do that, that uh, you know, America wouldn't deserve it. Right, so the, the, now in, 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 this, in this section, uh, we see uh, one of the ways that uh, he works, his justice plan through nature. You know, we can see in a number of places in the Old Testament uh, that God had done this as well. You know, he, he's done this with Noah's flood. Uh, you know, the plagues on Egypt that uh, showed that uh, their, their false gods were, were a joke, and he used their own, own gods against them. Uh, uh, the, uh, the donkey that spoke, you know, the uh, sun standing still at uh, Gibeon, the flooding of the Kishon Brook, drought in Elijah's day, and the fish, uh, uh, the fish in Jonah, and the uh, locust plague in Joel. You know, just as God controls the moral and spiritual uh, realms, uh, you know, to do this, we can see uh, from these examples that He also uses nature as well. So Nahum uses some uh, uh, striking word word pictures to describe you know, exactly uh, God's power. So he, uh, you know, so we can look at, uh, see, verse uh, in, in verse three here, where he talks about, you know, the, the Lord you know, have, having His way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and uh, the, the the clouds and the dust of His feet. You know, we can see that, uh, you know, the the mountains are quaking uh, as we go as we go on down. You know, he's you know, rebuking the sea. And then uh, verse 8 mentions that overrunning flood. And uh, you know, speaking of that, uh, of that flood, it's uh, not necessarily uh, you know, literal here. It's you know, referring to some uh, things that would happen as used figuratively. However, uh, historical records also show that the uh, Tigris River, uh, at one point it's at its highest flood stage in 612 B.C., the waters rose nearly to the top of the city walls. And so we can see the Lord's power in the natural order, uh, and He, you know, does that using several fa factors. So, uh, for one, these uh, shaking storms and uh, these shakings and storms serve to get people's attention. You know, it showed that you know God is present, and uh, the, you know the purpose of these dramatic weather events that's described in uh, these verses uh, three, four, and five uh, are to announce His presence. And it's uh, called a uh, a theophany. You know, it just shows that God's presence is just like the pillar of fire uh, you know, for the Israelites. You know, and that cloud by day is showing that He's there. And so, uh, 
You know, in this description, we see that the winds formed his path, uh, his way through on that field of battle. That the uh, clouds were the very dust that were picked up as his, as his feet come down and he walked onto the battlefield. Um, you know, that shows that the, uh, as he comes, uh, you know, our mighty God comes into that skirmish. And another thing it, uh, of his purpose of using nature is to expose these false gods. Uh, so many of these uh, false gods like Baal uh, were gods of the storm, and, which is exactly what he's describing that he actually has power over, whereas you know, Baal supposedly did. Um, and we can see that and where I mentioned back in Elijah's drought, uh, that he uses that drought to expose the fact that Baal doesn't have any power. You know, he can't give you that rain. Only God can. And so uh, in, in here it describes that same kind of thing. That he drives up the rivers and causes them to swell. Uh, you know, even these uh, specific places that he mentions, uh, Bashan and Caramel, were fertile areas on the east and west side of the Jordan, having some of the most lush greenery uh, that he could dry up at, at, you know, his, at his command. Uh, you know, we, we can do the same thing uh, for, for Lebanon, which is uh, in the north. You know, it was known for its large trees, you know, its cedars. So we can see that creation itself turns as his hand to show his, just, to show his justice. So the, uh, the last part here after we're talking about judgment is we go into uh, God showing his uh, justice and offering his love to a sinful world. So we're looking at, you know, some of the, uh, his redemption, his redemptive power. So, you know, even as God brought upon the Assyrian capital and the entire nation the act of judgment, uh, it, it, he brought deliverance to his own people. You know, these uh, very people that uh, the Assyrians that he used to afflict them, uh, you know, are, 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 he's also you know, saving them from, from them now. You know, the same Lord that punishes also saves. Uh, we see that described in the, at the start of uh, verse 3, you know, that he's uh, slow to anger and great in power, but at the same time, he will also not acquit the wicked. And he's still going to hold them to that standard and, and their punishment. So you know, he's going to punish the wicked with his righteous vengeance, but he's patient, long-suffering. And then these two seemingly opposite characteristics of God is something that throws off a lot of people. Uh, I have a hard time understanding it with that, but it's important to you know, understand the Old Testament concept of justice. You know, God is just because it's his very nature. And then so uh, when he pours out his wrath upon sin and, you know, and also when he uh, you know, gives a pitiful sinner the, his grace and love, uh, he's being true, true and consistent with himself. Uh, for uh, God to forgive and save Israel you know, when, he had, when, he, when he had to because they too had worshipped uh, idols and it was just because of his essence. But at the same time, you know, when he uh, later on is he's a loving and, and righteous God as well, that you know, he he saves is going to save them later on as it's described here. Uh, so in his justice he is good. You know, God doesn't set aside his goodness even in the middle of his wrath. You know that's uh, not, not something is uh, so when he puts his wrath upon those that reject his grace, it magnifies his grace all the more. Now, he never deals with anyone unju unjustly. He sends punishment or deliverance. You know, you have that chance to accept him or reject him. So, you know, once you have the knowledge and you accept him, you know, he, he's, he's justified in giving you that deliverance. But if you have the information and you reject him, then he's justified in laying down that punishment. So, uh, and we can look at uh, you know, this next portion in verse 7. If the Lord is good and a stronghold in the day of trouble. And so, you know, it says here that he's good and he's right. And that means that and the, you know, his, his, his grace means that he's a stronghold in that midst of judgment. And he's often compared to a stronghold in, uh, in, in the Old Testament. You know, that's a, a fortress that's uh, you know, built up and uh, usually up on a hill. You know, somewhere that's, that's hard to reach and it's very secure in a time of battle. And uh, you know, we can look in, you know, just a great example here is looking back at the Psalms. We can go back to Psalm 18 where he's uh, described as a, as a stronghold and a fortress here. Uh, eight, Psalm 18, 2. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and is my deliverer. 
my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler, and the horn of my salvation, and my high tower. You know, again, that, that fortress that, that's, a, that's above everything else and keeps you safe. And uh, you know, those who turn to him will have nothing to fear. You know, as we see that the, you know, he that knoweth and trusts him in that, in that verse 7 is what it's referring to. If God saves his people, Israel, you know, here's what he's talking about, and he still saves those who trust him today. And so, uh, you know, though Assyria had served as that interest uh, or that instrument to chastise his people, uh, you know, God Himself was behind the uh, enemies and the, and the oppression. And uh, you know, now that brutality would end, and Nineveh would fall. And we can see that, you know, again mentioned in verse 12, that uh, you know that they would be cut off, and uh, you know when He shall pass through, it, you know, He's saying that you know I've afflicted the Israel, but I'm not going to afflict you anymore. I'm, and, uh, you know, in, in verse 13, it talks about you know, breaking the yoke off of these. So he's going to take that burden off of them and, uh, you know, release them from that. You know, that God would break that yoke and his people would be, who were captive to the Assyrians would be set free. And then we can, uh, you know, we can also see that, you know, again, and some of the other prophets, we can look at Isaiah, for example. If we go into, into 10, then it will we'll really explain this judgment and using the Assyrians. So in 10.5, he says, uh, O Assyrian, the rod of mine anger, and the staff in their hand is my indignation. So he's specifically saying that I'm using you. Uh, I will send him against an hypocritical nation, and against the people of my wrath will I give him charge to take spoil, and to take down the prey, and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. So you know, here he's setting out these first two verses that he's using uh, Assyria, but uh, you know later on we, uh, you know, in these verses we can go to uh, verse verse uh, twelve here, where it changes over. He says, "Wherefore it shall come to pass that when the Lord hath performed His whole work upon Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, I will punish the fruit of the stout heart of the king of Assyria and the glory of his high looks." So, you know, he's going to use them for that, and then once he's done taking care of Israel, he's going to go and look back to Assyria and take care of them. And then in verse 15, you know, we uh, wrap everything up here, and we have that, we have this message of hope. And it's telling of a messenger spreading to deliver good news. You know, he's coming from the uh, mountains and uh, giving good tidings. Uh, and it, it's you know it's from Nineveh that they would come a message of peace or uh, or shalom in the Hebrew, which is that uh, that God's uh, total blessing and provisions. And uh, you know, the Lord is we can see that through this the Lord is fulfilling His covenants, uh, even as they once more fulfill their promises to Him. You know this uh, this restored salvation is the fulfillment. In, in, you know later on that we see in Christ Himself. And uh, we can look at, you know, again at, uh, at, at Isaiah. And uh, I'm going to look at uh, in Isaiah 52 in, uh, verse, uh, in verse 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth, bringeth good tidings. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that saith in Zion, thy God reigneth. So, you know, here again it's saying that your, your God reigns. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's, that's the good news. And it's, it's pointing to, uh, you know, as, we, as you look at Isaiah 52, Jesus Christ, because uh, we can look at 13 and it mentions it there, the servant. It says, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. And that's just the beginning of that little, uh, you know, that servant poem that's in Isaiah that, that talks about Jesus and his coming. And uh, you know, dying for our sins so that we can be redeemed, and, uh, and so we you know, we can we can remember that, and we can have a, a great way to share that with uh, you know with you know, with the lost and dying world, you know, as they as they fear death and uh, you see these things coming against them, you know, we can let them know that you know there is that hope, and you know you have the, the two choices once it's presented. You can either uh, you know take his you know, take his mercy, or you can reject it. And either way, God will be justified. All right, I hope you all have a, have a good week and a good week of studying, and uh, God bless you all.